think Dan did go to the, oh, Dan's back. All right, um, I'll take verbal POS. Is that one ready? All right, in that case, I will start time in three, two, one. Oftentimes, the most meaningful levers of change are the ones that people don't generally consider. First, definitions, and then our, our general arguments. We're defining this house as a rational actor, and then we want to note that, like, idealists are people who are, like, guided more by the idea of, like, principles, morality, than, like, more necessarily, like, practical considerations, more on-the-ground considerations, which means that realists on, uh, realists, on the other hand, would be those that consider more pragmatic considerations that are more in the moment, more geared towards, like, short-term goals that might seem more reasonable. Okay, so, like, we also know it's not a question of, like, which we prefer in isolation. It's, like, each exists in the current world. What matters more for social movements? That is what we're debating today. First intention, then, is it generally idealists are better for the social movement. First mechanism is just the Overton window. You can look at individuals like Greta Thunberg, where, like, they push for more lofty goals or, like, ideas because they're, like, they want to actually incentivize change, where allies seem, like, shift shift the general perspective about these issues or like pressing issues like climate change in that case right so the, these are people pushing for things like zero carbon uh, carbon dioxide emissions by like a, like 2030 or like 2040 these are people pushing to appeal to like international audiences and to appeal to the broader broader necessity of uh, like of fixing these things in a timely fashion so therefore because you have these more like idealistic, more lofty appeals. This makes moderate sectors of these organizations, like the environmental movement, seem more reasonable, which is uniquely important because it allows for more buy-in, because it allows for greater support. And this, another example of this is just like the civil rights movement and how Malcolm X more extreme style of advocating through like for a state of like for a separate state for African-Americans made more moderate appeals with, from figures like MLK, far more appealing and therefore far more effective for the general movement as a whole. Second mechanism then is idealism necessitates dreaming. First, why is dreaming uniquely important? We think that it, one, it creates a lot more opportunities, right? When you're constantly envisioning how social media can be dramatically better or reach new heights, you have a greater opportunity and lens to pursue these things. It may seem unlikely or difficult, but you actually have access to this on our side when you have more idealists. It means that you get opportunities to improve like uh, the organization that simply can't happen as a realist because you consider ideas that are more out of the box. You consider ideas that other, like the average person might not think. Therefore, you have a greater ability to, to have like a 10 times factor. So like what this essentially means is that oftentimes unconventional outside the box thinking is what actually differentiates one social movement from another. And so far as like many social movements employ similar strategies, novel strategies and pursuits can really, really make a, like a specific organization stand out. Meaning that like insofar as you have a lot of limited resources to promote change in the status quo, which looks like limited political, research, political capital, lim limited economic capital, limited media attention. When you actually stand out as a social movement, it creates a uniquely powerful mechanism for change because you're more likely to get those resources. You're more likely to be able to achieve your more lofty goals. Third, uh, thirdly, under this, like the idea of like perception, right? If you look at how the followers perceive the general organization, when you dream big, even if you don't necessarily reach your goals, you at least give a sense of accomplishment. Comparatively, when you focus more on like present smaller goals, it means that you don't get the bigger picture. You don't get those greater appeals. And as an organization, you're more likely to feel bogged down and ineffective. So we think that like, even if like, this is not factually or like realistically true in that like, it, while it might seem like you're ineffective, you're actually doing things as a social movement. We'd say that even if this is true, optically, it still has the same difference because when your followers feel like the social movement is not actually enacting change, it's not inching forward, that this illusions them, that's, that this incentivizes them from actually continuing to contribute to the organization, which means that on it, you have a greater decrease in like productive change, decrease in actually advancing towards your goals. So what this means then is that it's much easier to show that a movement is going somewhere when you have this broader picture, when you have this idea of dreaming big, right? Because you feel like you have progress instead of only achieving a very small goal that seems insignificant. Okay. 
So thirdly, under this idea of why dreaming is important, we, we think like idealism attracts introspection. When idealists push for conventional, unconventional thinking, or like more magnanimous proposals that often relates to the core of what the social, like what the social movement is talking about, like their messaging, what they, what, what they were created for, the exigence. To expand horizons, you need to understand what exactly this organization is pursuing and how that looks on looks like on a greater scale. Meaning that when idealists push for really broad proposals, like the net uh, debt reduction in CO2 example, that means that you're also simultaneously pushing for discussion and greater like, uh, like the I appeal to the greater purpose and meaning of the organization. Because insofar as a social movement is typically trying to fix some like really, really urgent issue in the status quo that is in need of change. And therefore, when you have this clarity of purpose, when you appeal to the importance and urgency of such an issue, it clarifies and motivates followers in a, in a, in a fashion that simply can't be possible with realists. Second contention is better reach. First mechanism, you generally like, it's like you increase fervor and support and buy-in into the organization because when you have this like rhetoric of broad goals of like appealing to, to feel like emotions, this means that you're more likely to appeal to the general masses. You're more likely to appeal to the average citizen because people are inherently emotive creatures. And when you have these goals that really connect on the emotional level of people, it means a lot more to them than simply like stating facts like, oh, 40% of Americans are currently like overweight or obese. So like, when you have emotive anecdotes, when you have emotive plays, it really, really increases buy-in because people are more likely to sympathize. People are more likely to feel like it's an urgent issue. Second mechanism is you give people hope. They're, these are people who stick with their ideals and more likely to be impassioned, right? We think that when you have this deep passion, when you have like an adherence to your basic ideals, other people would more likely be like able to catch on to your dream, catch on to your vision and kind of contribute to it, to expand it, to uh, like add nuance to it. And we think that like this is important because it gives a messaging effect. As like a leader, if you're an idealist, it signals that there is a possibility for greater change. And that was really appealing for people because it gives them hope. Third mechanism, more media attention. We think this is generally quite straightforward and intuitive. People are more interested in listening to more emotive pleas. Therefore, like when you have more emotive pleas, the media is more likely to capitalize on it and give you media time. Fourth mechanism, you lower the barrier of entry. We just say like it's a lot easier to understand emotional messaging than really technical messaging, which means you still appeal more to masses. So proud to affirm. Thank you. All right. Um, everyone's ready. I will begin my time of eight minutes starting now. Gov is right when they come into this debate and tell you why idealists are important to a social movement. However, we think they fall short when they fail to be comparative because this debate isn't about whether idealists are good and realists are bad, but rather which group does more to benefit society and the social movement. At the point at which idealists have great ideas but create no tangible change, we are so proud to oppose. A few things in this round, first going to go into an observation at the top of the case, then I'm going to go into our two contentions on side opposition, then go back and decide government's case. First, an observation. I think we need to be clear here that this debate really comes down to what is more important to a social movement. That means we need to look at incentives. Some basic incentives we're going to outline on side opposition include, number one, the idea to create actionable change. Number two, the idea to have good buy-in, to want more people to join your movement. And three, the idea to have a good societal perspective. You want people to view your movement in a positive light and not think you're crazy and actually think you have the ability to create change. With that, let's move into our two contentions. First, on how this is beneficial to society. Second, on, sorry, first on how this is beneficial to the social movement. Second, on how this is beneficial to society. First, on social movement. Under this contention, three subpoints. First subpoint, overall external perception. A little bit of framing at top of this subpoint, but realists in general are a more moderate perspective, which means the movement becomes more palatable for two main reasons. Polarization, number one, polarization is simply harder to appeal to because less people align with a polar polarized view than a one-sided view. But secondly, they're more related to, relatable to people because they talk about real life issues. Let's look at an example. You have someone from the feminism movement look going and speaking at an event saying, look, we know 
know we can't change the world, but we can at least minimize the pay gap versus someone saying we should all be polygamous. The moderate is obviously going to be more appealing to a larger scope of people because polygamy is harder to buy into than the idea that we can minimize the gender pay gap, even if they are both feminist ideals. This means at the end, you're more palatable, meaning you're going to get better external perception and more buy-in. Second subpoint under this contention is the scope of the movement and reach. We're arguing it's going to be better. Realists, in general, tend to be more broad in their thinking in order to get results. Logically, you have to get the majority to agree with you, and they are more willing to compromise because they are in a realistic perspective where they realize they can't get everything. They have to pick up some bad things and some good things to get their goals. This means they will actively do the outreach to more people to ensure they get the support they need. And what does this mean at the end? More people are going to simply be involved in the activist movement, more people are going to be aware, which means you're just going to have more buy and more success. Realists make the effort to include everyone because they have less stringent limitations on who they will work with. This means you're going to have more impacts to social movements. You're going to further the message to more people. You're overall going to get more buy-in that's going to go straight into your incentives. Third and final subpoint under this contention is that you're going to be more committed to the movement. Counterintuitively, we would argue that the realists have more buy into the social movement than the idealists for two main reasons. Number one, it is super easy to be an idealist because anyone can go online and say, oh, the world should change in X, Y, and Z way, but it's a lot harder to think of the actionable steps to make that actually happen. Secondly, since realists have to put in more thought to understand how to make societal change, how to be realistic, they likely understand the goals, the ideals, the workings of a movement more deeply than someone with whimsical ideas, meaning they are more likely to buy in, meaning they are more likely to be committed to this movement. This means the realists at the end of this are more likely to work harder for the ideals, more likely to promote the social movement, more likely to make actionable change. Second contention I'm under like this whole case is on the benefit to society. Under this contention, two subpoints. First, this idea of tangible change. Gov can try to come in here and tell you the idealists are going to work harder, be more radical. However, when the realists decided that this would decide they want tangible change, we want the outcome is that the idealists throw their hands up and say, this is not enough. When realists say, this is how we need to make this tangible change, idealists are going to be, no, that's not enough. We need more and don't work to create this tangible change. An example of this is when AOC didn't vote on the bipartisan infrastructure bill, even though it would benefit her constituents because it didn't do enough. The idealists don't settle. This means idealists won't agree to compromise because compromise goes against their morals, it means you're not going to get any tangible change because the moment you say it's not doing enough it means you never get anything in the first place and you never get change happening overall. Whether or not AOC was right in saying that, oh, this doesn't do enough, the point is you want at least some change that's going to benefit your movement than none at all. Second some point under this contention is this vouches for compromise. Trivially, realists encourage realism on a societal and infrastructural level. Go back to our AOC example. She voted voted against the bipartisan bill, but it was still passed because the realists won out. Why did they win out? Because they were the only group able to amass enough support. And at the end of the day, that bill will help marginalize people, but it, which is a net good regardless of how Gov will try to tell you that it doesn't do enough. It does something, which is better than wanting more and getting none of it. Realists who compromise help build a collaborative society that has productive discourse instead of gridlock. We have to start slowly before we gain enough momentum to enact permanent radical change. How do we get this momentum? We need to compromise. This can only be done by the realists. The idealists will never do a good job at that. With that, let's move into side government's case, respond to some of their contentions. First thing they tell you is that there's going to push the Overton window. It's going to make these lofty goals more realistic. Yes, but we are given no reason why coming up with ideas does more for social movements than putting those plans into actions. Three reasons why making change is better. Number one, anyone can come up with ideas. You are less important because anyone can decide they want something to happen, meaning you aren't a finite resource. Anyone can post on Instagram, this is what we want our social movement to do. Second, the end goal of social movements, the reason they do what they do is to make exchange is to make change. Meaning, if you are the climate change movement, you want to minimize climate change. Your incentive is to minimize climate change in the long term more than coming up with ideas that may be good. Third, making change gets more buy-in because if people such as like if people see that you are successful, then they agree and are more likely to join in. Because if they see a movement as actually creating tangible change, they're going to be like, oh, this is a realistic movement. I'm going to want to buy in. They're actually making changes in society versus one that does nothing at all. Their second sub point here is on idealism necess necessitates dreaming. First of all, this is not unique. Once again, anyone can dream. You aren't super important because anyone can do it. But on individuals influence in the movement, we don't know why this is a benefit for the social movement because Gov gives us no warranting as to why this individual 
individual's influence is better than any other individual. You can't just assert that one individual having influence is going to be good, especially when we tell you the realists are going to be more important than an idealist. Third thing they talk about is perception. They try to tell you that you dream big, even if you don't reach goals, you get a sense of accomplishments, you feel better. But the idea here is when you get, you get more of a sense of an accomplishment and you feel better when you actually see change coming from your actions. So if you're realistic and you actually see change, you're gonna feel better than if you're trying your best to come up with an idea and nothing actually comes from it. Then the clarity of the purpose within the social movements point, we think that anyone that's involved with a movement who is considering if realism or idealism is the best manner to go about affecting change is probably invested enough in the movement to have knowledge about what the goal is. We don't think this is a big issue, but we also don't think realists are going to be so drastically in opposition with the movement they are fighting for. Moving on to their second contention on better reach. Their first thing they tell you is you're going to have more buy-in and support. But what does emotional appe appeal even mean for a movement? Do we care if a speech about gun violence moves someone to tears if they still vote for the NRA supporting politicians? No, you can make someone feel something, but it doesn't guarantee action. But secondly, as much as it gives people hope, it turns more people away for being like this movement is unrealistic. If someone's hearing a speech and they're like, this isn't realistic, why am I gonna buy into it? It's gonna turn as many people away for as many people it brings in. On their point about hope, again, hope without responsive action is useless. Third thing on media attention, more media attention. Again, more media attention doesn't do anything without structural change, but you're also going to get media attention on either side. It's not really unique. And then fourth on the lower barrier to entry, we directly clash with this on our first two sub points for contention one. We tell you why people are actually more likely to buy into the realist perspective and advocacy for all those reasons. Super proud to oppose. <laughs> I thank the League of Opposition for their eloquent remarks and call to stand the honorable member of government to give a speech not exceeding eight minutes with a 30 second grace. Year, year. All right, I will start my time in three, two, one. So I'm going to quickly go over my opponent's case and then my own case. Basically, a lot of things are going to be like cross applied. Um, so onto my opponent's first connection about actual change, they talk about like external perception and that like realists are more moderate. So here I'm going to like clash with this and say that like basically when you push for more lofty goals, you're able to get more change. Why? Basically, like when you look at social movements where there are people like Malala or Greta Thunberg pushing for more extremist ideas like police brutality being uh, like the like existential threats posed by like police brutality or climate change, those are the people who are likely to push for more hardline solutions, like getting rid of all carbon emissions. And therefore it's good to have more radical activists, especially in these situations where there are going to be more hardline solutions. Um, sorry, protect the time. And basically these hardline solutions are oftentimes radical solutions that are needed to like achieve change, but a realist won't push for these solutions because they see these solutions as harder to obtain, right? So what then happens is firstly, if this is like what the movement is pushing for, it makes people more like to engage with it because people feel like this is the change that needs to happen in order for things to actually be solved. But also like, so if that change is, the, is what basically gets pushed for, it's more likely to happen. Right, and that's good on net, but also like having idealists in the movement also makes like more moderate um, decisions or more moderate um, policies more likely to be worthwhile to like push for because of the fact that you shift the Overton window, which means that when people look at like the more extreme or the more idealist side of the uh, side of the movement, they're more likely to say, oh, those are like more extreme, but we agree that these things are like things that needs to be solved. And then they look at like the more moderate parts of the uh, and then it makes like basically the more moderate wings of the movement seem more palatable therefore people even if they're not as hardline to push for those goals they're much more likely like moderates to actually support the more moderate wings of the movement therefore you still get more change instead of if you basically only have like moderate wings of the movement where there isn't this shifting of the overton window shifting of what is actually like extreme then the moderate wing actually seems like the moderate wing in the status quo actually seems more extreme therefore you get less change so you uniquely need like realist and more extreme ideas in the movement in order for moderate policies to seem like more moderate as we call it and basically have those things be changed so an example of this could be like malala asking for like zero carbon emissions like in the next decade or two or like malcolm x shifting the overton window to make um mlk seem like a leader that like the the legislators more want to like engage with whereas 
like basically if you only have the moderate wing you're less likely to get those changes you're less likely to be seen as actually moderate without this comparison right so you actually get a lot less change on their side of the house whereas having these um having these idealists in the movement actually creates change and notes that like neither side is advocating for like only having one or the other, but we think that like idealists uniquely push for this shifting of the Overton window. So therefore like they're uniquely necessi uh, a necessity for these movements. Secondly, on their like, on their overall perception point in their first connection, they talk about like how realists have more buy-in because it's easier uh, because like it's like more moderate again the reason why they are currently moderate is because of the fact that they're realists in order for people to see these more realists as moderate so therefore actually we push more people into the movement for that reason but also for the reason that Dan already gives you which is like one you're more emotive so you uniquely engage people who are more likely to be emotive who are less likely to engage with the technicalities of the movement i.e like what exactly is like the I don't know, the carbon gases in the atmospheres or things like that because of the fact that like a lot of people just like don't engage with those things. So in that respect, I'll get to it in the end if I have time. In that respect, like you get more people who are likely to buy more into the movement when you go onto the television and say um, things that are more idealistic, more emotive, but also you uniquely like on the ground, you uniquely engage people who are like, younger because those people are more likely to be more extremists or to be more idealistic than understand like the exact technicalities of the movement and therefore this overall creates um this overall makes the unique impact of like pulling in certain sects of people that you wouldn't have be able to like bring into the movement otherwise which means that overall you get Firstly, more people engage, and this per, like, this creates more on the ground societal change. This humanizes, for example, the LGBTQ community when a wide like when there is more widespread understanding of the movement and more engagement in the movement, and therefore there's like more social pressure to do things like um ask like to have people or employers recognize those people as people and humanize them as equals. And this is like just as important, if not as important as like legislation, because again, also when there's like on the ground social change and this like shifting of the Overton window and also more people engaging the movement, it's more likely for people to push for those legislative changes that needs to happen in order to solve the issues. They also say that like, so basically we actually get the point of like um, getting more buy-in because idealists uniquely actually pull in more people for the reasons that we already give you. They also say like these um, people who are more realistic, they have more understanding of the goals and ideas. Like we think that idealists still understand the goals and ideas of the movement, but they also push for more lofty goals. Like these lofty goals aren't like, they don't have any like mechanism or they don't push for any things to like actually achieve these lofty goals because you see a lot of people like having actual like proposing legislation or thinking of ideas to get um to have like uh like to like push for legislation such as like defunding the police or things like that in order to make police brutality less harmful for those communities but like they just push for more extremist ideas which again we think is on net a good thing also on perception it seems like underwhelming to say things like, oh, we can't get complete equality, but let's make this pay gap like 10 cents smaller. If people lead with this perception, it feels to the people outside the movement like you're less able to get change and less willing to like have the have the push or like the extreme forces that are needed in order to get rid of these like hardline issues and find the hardline solutions that people perceptually think that these things, uh, that these like movements need. Also just like, again, clash with the emotions. They say that like, realists don't include um, like solutions, but they do evidently because they want to like still have change. And also they say like realists don't include anyone, everyone. Um, they say that like realists include everyone. We say no, realists actually don't include everyone because they see some people as like harder to engage with and just like don't spend, spend time with them. But we think that like, even if those people are like harder to engage with, real idealists are the people who are more likely to say, oh, everyone should, want to engage with this movement and they're more likely to reach out to different people that realists won't. So again, more like more perceptual, more engagement, etc. And this leads to the impacts of like getting legislation passed, getting on the ground change of changing people's perception, which is again very important. They also say like there's better buy-in 
and like there's less compromise. They use the example of AOC. We see this example of AOC is pretty much cherry picked. In general, I think that like if you're a person in the movement and there is a good legislation that is being proposed, then you would want to support that legislation, right? Even if you're an idealist, because that is like a stepping stone towards your goals and also um, in general, like, so in general, this is not what's going to happen. But also, if AOC is an example of an idealist, she probably knew that this legislation was going to be passed either way, even if she didn't support it. And we can see that she is a person who is a good example for, like, being able to galvanize a lot, a lot of people and gain a lot of support and um, overall get a lot of people, like, vouching for her. And this is also, again, unique to, like, her and also people like her who are, like, leaders of these movements. For all of these reasons, so proud to affirm. Okay, I'm just gonna take a sip of water. I thank the member of government for their eloquent remarks and call to the stand the prime member. I completely screwed this up. That was the. That was MG. Okay, good side. <laughs> okay, great. Um, I will begin my time in three, two, one. So hi, I'm Jennifer Levine, and I'm gonna go on to um, op case first, actually just rebuilding, and then I'll go back onto gov, and then I'll do a little bit of preliminary weighing before my partner gets into it, just to explain to you why op has won this round. Okay, so first I'm gonna go into the refutations of our case. So first they talk about how, when you push for lofty goals, you get more change. They give examples of social movements with Malala and Greta Thunberg, they push for more extremist ideas. So I kind of like to ask the question, like what progress has Greta Thunberg made besides making speeches? Like climate change has still like become like a steadily increasing problem since she's like entered like the political advocacy sphere. Like a lot of things have not changed. They make an assertion, but they have no mechanism for why it's true. On their point about the Overton window, which is also like one of their um, contingents, you can cross apply that here, that basically the Overton window doesn't matter without the realists having a more moderate alternative, right? So all of their points about like why that's good, it doesn't exist without the realists first. It's like this kind of like chicken and egg kind of like situation where you can't get the change without the proposals by the realists. Like Gov concedes that the realist motions are the ones that get that get passed. And then they say like, oh, like the idealists help it out. Well, that wouldn't be able to happen without the realists making those like plans in the first place. Furthermore, they talk about how we need like idealists um, to like push these things. And basically we like to say that like there are a lot of idealists because it is easy to be an idealist. So take all of the reasoning that Sophie gave you about why um, realists have more buy-in in our uh, first contention or about how like people are more motivated, people like care more when they're realists because it takes a lot more effort to be a realist. And we'll tell you that we're actually more likely to have like a bunch of like idealists that are like casually like involved in a movement. So if this one rational actor really wants to make change, they should be a realist because it's a lot harder. And there are fewer people because nobody like wants to do like the hard job however it's the more rewarding job and it's the one that creates more change for the reasons that i'm going to give you now okay so then they talk about um they respond to our point about like the scope of the movement they reach and they say that um on their side you and uniquely engage people who really care so there are more people like likely to buy into the movement right so they talk about like engaging a younger range of activists specifically so two response um two responses here one they those people those younger activists can't vote like they can't affect structural change yet so we should actually be focusing on people who do have political power and secondly while the youth may buy in they are less likely to make that change um and uniquely they are less likely to buy into the movement long term so we're when we're looking at like the long-term plan here of like what's best for the movement actually this is going to be a net negative because these people like we don't have a guarantee that they're going to like stick with this they're just like young at this point and then on pulling in more people we both get more people right like this is kind of like a wash point here because like either you get like the younger generation on side gov or you get like the moderates who aren't very politically active or passionate on side up however if you're going to weigh this who is better to have on your side who has more sway probably the financially independent older people who have political capital and those are the people that you get on the realist side on side op then they talk about how um realists don't think of ideas they um they don't create solutions and we'd like to say that like they're busy trying to compromise here like there's like this assumption that, like they never create like ideas that's just like not true like they do have ideas like they give you the example of like malcolm x versus like martin luther king uh, like martin luther king had a lot of ideas like despite being the one who was like more of a realist like he definitely did his ideas just like kind of got like overshadowed by like the more like extreme ones because those are the ones that get attention but that's not to say that they don't have ideas and those ideas were very valid and very like good so like this idea that like they don't have ideas just isn't true it's just like they're focused saying like kind of cherry picking on like these specific ideas whereas like we're going to tell you that the realist ideas are just as like good and just helpful for the social movements then they talk about how um a perception of like low stakes and like people will be like less willing and able to get change if like the leaders of the movement tell you oh like we're like trying to like move slowly here however we would like to push back on this because we don't think this is true like 
once you've like lived in like the world for a certain amount of time you kind of have like a lower expectation for things so when someone like promises you something really big and lofty you're probably like gonna doubt it a little bit like i don't know like sometimes my parents tell me no they're they're like like they do it in a sarcastic way they're like oh yeah and then like we'll get you like a, a new car too you know it's like something like sarcastic that like a really big ask because they're demonstrating that it's probably not going to happen so actually when you like as like an ideal it's kind of like propose these like lofty ideals like the to use the phrasing that gov is saying they're saying that like it's like people really think that like they care about the movement everyone who is like over like a certain age and like has lived in the world long enough knows that those big things don't actually happen and gov concedes that when they say that the only thing they idealists do is make it easier for the moderates the realists to pass their legislation which means that people aren't actually going to be like super excited or like super amped up by like someone telling you oh we're gonna like solve like racism we're gonna solve sexism we're gonna solve climate change like all in this movement like that's just not very realistic they people would rather have logical reasons as to why something happens firstly and secondly the people who don't have like as much of an emotional buy-in here and the people who like gov is kind of trying to tell you like will be discouraged by the realists the people who are kind of separate from that the people who are like kind of just like indifferent about these situations, they're more likely to support a movement if they get the actual link chain about how the moderates, the realists, will actually affect that change, as opposed to the idealists who are just proposing ideas. And those people have no like reason to buy into those ideas. Whereas if someone who like doesn't really care about like a societal issue, say like climate change, and then they see that like the realists have like a logical reasoning as to why they're like um, advocacy will work, they're more likely to support that if they don't have like an emotional attachment to either way. So again, our point of engagement here is like kind of a watch like both sides like get like more and less engagement. We're kind of telling you like very similar things here. However, like the kind of thing that you can like weigh this on is like what engagement matters more. And we would like to say that on the long term and like for like actual infrastructural change, the better engagement that you get here is from like a wider scale of people and not just like the people that are like super like young and passionate about this, like because we're going to tell you that they're probably also going to get involved in the movement either way, regardless of whether it's like realist or idealist. So like, like we're probably going to get some of those people anyway and so gov's point is not very unique in this case then they talk about um on our second contention they talk about how um aoc was a cherry picked example they said that as an idealist you would still probably vote for these things and they give it um aoc is like a good example for galvanizing and like getting more support however like a lot of AOC's like things that like, have not like been passed without compromise so if you look at like the green new deal which is like her whole thing right like when like they most more recently like a few months ago passed like something like in like against climate change they also had to put in a bunch of things so like the republicans would vote for it so like they did a bunch of things that like joe manchin wanted right like they put that into it and that was like her like she spearheaded that and then like they kind of like had to water it down into something that was a compromise however that was really good for like the like movement against climate change because like it was able to pass some laws however was it like ideals like did she completely agree with that i doubt it and that's why her like initial bill has not gotten passed yet because it doesn't work like that it's just not a logical thing to happen so actually if you look at that all the things that aoc like suggests or like the things that like she the good ideas like that she has they only work when you compromise which is all of the things that you get on side up so you can go back to what sophie tells you all of her things about compromise in our second contention about why people vouch for compromise under on um, the second sub point all of those things still cross the flag and we tell you that that is more likely to actually enact change okay now i'm going to go on to uh side gov case really quickly um just to refute so um they don't give you a lot of like new um like kind of rebuilding on their case. So um, I'm kind of just gonna, like go through um, what they said in their first speech. So they basically talk about um, the overturn window, which you can cross by with my uh, rebuilding of our case. They talk about idealism and necessity streaming. They talk about perception. And basically a lot of these points are in direct class with each other, which is like a very clean like debate for judges to look at. But basically what you see here is that under like the idea of perception, both sides are kind of saying like, oh, like, we get like good optics from like one side, we get good optics from the other side. And we're telling you that who is the more influential party to get those like good optics and like that good like image from, we're telling you that it is the people who are realists, the people who aren't like gonna be like caring as much, who don't have like emotional investment in this movement. They're the ones who are gonna be like, oh, well, I mean, if I'm gonna pick like between these two things because it is like a comparative round, then I would rather pick the realists because they have more tangible impacts. They have like more logical reasoning. I'm just gonna pick that because I don't have like as much of an emotional stake in this. So they're probably gonna pick that. And those are the people that we need to get involved in the movements. The people who don't actually like have a motivation to act right now, we need to give them a motivation to act. And all these ideals are not giving them that motivation to act. Then they talk about um better reach. They basically talk about like all these issues. And basically, you know, all of our piece really just like clashes with each other. So kind of like the, um, the one thing I kind of wanted to like, no. Uh, productive time um so basically what i want to like kind of like quickly just like touch on the very end of my speech here is so like what you see here is that you have like one side which is like very like reliant on the other side so like you have like side gov which is reliant on like side off like the realists like kind of like pushing certain things whereas like on side up you don't need to rely on the realists so if you're a comparative if we're forced to choose between these two things both sides agree that like it would be better to have both working in tandem however the only side that is self-reliant and does not need the other side to succeed in past uh movements and like create like social change on a societal level and what's best for the movement that's the only side that um gives you that is off and so i'm so proud to oppose thank you 
Alrighty. Okay. Um, is everyone ready? Okay. I will begin my time in three, two, one. Two things in this speech, first some characterization, then five independent off ballots. Let's look at what this debate is about. At top of my LOC, I tell you this debate is comparative. That means we are arguing about incentive. Who on net does more for incentives of the social movement? I have proposed to you three different incentives. None of them go refuted. Let's assume they still hold, tr hold true. Three incentives of these social movements. One, more actionable change. Second, more buy-in. Third, better societal perception. Briefly, how does op win under each of them? First, on actionable change. Jenny and I both tell you that it takes actionable and realistic ideas to put in the work to create change. Gov tries to assert to you that they create more change because radicals encourage people, but they have no solvency here, and words are great, but they're never going to create change. If they can't provide a mechanism for why this is true, you have to buy all the warranting I give you. The second thing we win at our buy-in is we prove to you, and it goes unresponded to the, is that to the first, realists will be more committed overall. The realist is just going to be more committed because they, one, understand the movement more, and two, it's harder to be a realist than it is to be an idealist. We also tell you that it's easier to buy a moderate perspective. Jenny then tells you why societal buy-in is at best a wash, but if anything, it flows to opt because we get the financially independent individuals voting while they get the youth who have no actual political capital or buy-in. Third reason we win third incentive is a better societal perception. Pretty simply, we tell you that it's harder to buy someone saying something rather radical on TV than it is to buy something that feels more realistic that actually gets things done. With that, let's move into the five independent opt ballots we have for you. First is on this buy-in of an individual activist. I give you two unrefuted reasons of why the realists are more committed to the movement. One, I tell you it is super easy to be an idealist because anyone can go online and say, oh, the world should change in X, Y, and Z way, but it's a lot harder to think of the actual steps to make that happen. But secondly, I tell you, since realists have to put more thought to understand how to make societal change, they understand the goals better. They understand the movement better. They're more likely to work harder. This is going to be the most important ballot here because if you have people within the movement making more societal change, that's going to be the largest impact and going to outweigh any benefit that Gov tries to give you because we tell you it's most important above anything else to have people who are actually going to work hard for the movement. When they don't respond to any of my warranting as to why why they are going to fight harder for the movement, why they're going to try harder. This is your first place you look, independent ballot right here. Second ballot is on normalizing compromising. Cleanly out of my LOC, I tell you that you normalize compromise in two ways, because one, the realists compromise more and that puts compromise on the forefront. But second, idealists throw their hands up and don't want to buy in, they don't want to settle. They say our AOC example is cherry picked. That is just simply not true. Again, an assertion, saying compromise is good is going to affect a broad scope of people at the point at which the whole world thinks compromise is more normal because they're seeing that on TV through social movements, that's going to have a large societal impact that dis disseminates to all people. If it has such a large scope, you're going to want to vote here. Huge impact. Moving on to our third independent ballot is all this barrier to entry. They try to tell you that the barrier to entry is much easier for this idealistic perspective, but we tell you that for committed barrier to entry, when you're having people who are actually going to engage in the movement, not just post something on media, it's much easier when you have a moderate who sounds more realistic, when it's something you can back behind, when it's something that's tangible. This goes unrefuted. You have to buy it. At the point at which it's easier for people to actually commit and buy in, we're going to value more committed buy-in than just whimsical buy-in on social media. So anything they tell you where, oh, more youth are now buying and people can enter more easily, like on a small level, you're going to buy the more radical buy-in, the more extreme buy-in. We tell you why you get this on our side. Fourth, um, independent ballot is on feeling accomplished. They try to tell you you feel accomplished for at least trying. We tell you you feel better when you create change. This doesn't go refuted. You have to buy it again. We tell you that you're going to feel better when you actually see effects come from your actions because people are going to feel better because it's going to help the people in the social movement stay committed because you're going to get more actionable change. One of the primary incentives vote for us here. Fifth and finally on perception, we say that when they see tangible change, people are more likely to buy in. If the perception is that you're creating change coming from the realists, coming from the people on TV who say, oh, we need to to lower the wage gap and the wage cap goes down, you're going to buy those people more. Since societal perception and scope is huge, you're going to vote for us here. For all those reasons, so proud to oppose. All right. So without further ado, I'll start my time in three, two, one. Two of our issues in this round. First, how we achieve change, and second, general buy-in. 
Okay, so I want to know that like we mentioned this idea of like a ten times factor early on in our speech. And so why is this really important? Because the magnitude of this impact is massive. Like when you have the idea of ideas opening opportunities that otherwise wouldn't be possible in a realist world, you're going to have a lot more levels to change because you're more likely to reach those ideas that other like that like a realist driven movement wouldn't actually engage with it. And because these ideas are more unique, they're out of the box, that means that you get a comparative edge to all other social movements. And you get to be like that one successful social movement that really capitalizes and changes the way people perceive social movements. So on that, you can vote on the actual scale and the magnitude of the impact insofar as it's going to be far greater than the more small, like short-term small goals that they make. Furthermore, we think that like the lack of satisfaction means you create more change, right? Because you don't have complacency. We know that they claim this idea of like idealism being like not unique and the idea of like um, this is gonna like just happen because anyone can just think of like idealist ideas. But, but the thing is like, we're saying idealism opens horizons and that is really important because when you have this, these like greater horizons that creates opportunities as mentioned before. And we think that like um, when you're stuck engaging in things like fundraisers or working parades at like a more realist level. We think that this is also like something that is quite commonplace. We don't think it's something that is necessarily unique. We don't think that's a fair point insofar as it's like pretty much symmetric on both sides. Okay, now importantly, they give this prereq analysis of realists going before idealists because they're like, you need to actually have change. Realists actually make change. The problem here is idealists, idealism expands the goals in a way that realists have something to work with towards so that that in itself is also a prerequisite because if you want meaningful change then you actually need ideals to push for the agenda so we think that like this idea of prereq analysis isn't actually as straightforward as they, they tell you because it could go either way so like it, it, it's in this case a wash but even if you don't like think it's a wash we actually say that we'd still get a comparative edge because even if they could pass a resolution on their side it's still far more watered down and ineffective they might tell you at least we're making change. But the problem is they're still stuck in the moment. If you look long-term, the same idealist proposals that were rejected in the status quo are more likely to be accepted in the future because they have been normalized. And that is really important because these same idealist proposals are the ones that have the greatest impact, that have the most possibility to actually increase, like actually act as a mechanism for change. Therefore, even if we are less likely to pass resolutions in the moment, when we do, they they're often far more impactful and widespread. They're often the ones that actually get like more buy-in, get more support. And, and then a bit more on that in the next one issue. But like now on purpose, right? They, they, like purpose means people are, are generally more committed. So like this is class of like what actually means a purpose. And they kind of say, this is just like when you actually do things, you get purpose. But we think like when you have this broader goal, you don't again, get bogged down to the minor details. Meaning that like, if you are struggling to generate funds for a like a venture, if you are struggling to get like um, political buy-in with a specific subject, as a realist, you're more likely to be disillusioned. You're more likely to drop out of movement, right? When you're an idealist, you have broader horizons. You're more likely to actually work. Like you're more likely to be like, okay, we're at least still making progress, and that means that people are still incentivized to push further and actually get what they're driving towards. Okay, second bullet issue: buy-in. Government tells you emotion and negative tells you like we get results. That is kind of the basic watered down comparison we have here. The thing is first, we still have results on our side because our side isn't just entirely people dreaming and standing idle. Rather we tell you that we get something like if you look at given given something between working like addressing workplace abuse by calling out abusive CEOs versus simply giving victims like more resources to address their situation, we think that the former may be harder to address, but it's still a far more worthwhile pursuit insofar as it actually gets more change, insofar as it actually like tackles the really core nitty gritty of the problem. So second, let's say you buy their best case and they, they get results, right? We still have results, we know, because we still have some realists on our side. So it's a lot more marginal like difference in results. The delta is a lot less than anything. Second, why do people care so much? Of, like, why do people care about social movements? We say it's because it appeals to exigence, it appeals to a greater purpose, it appeals to the feelings and emotions. On a deeper, lo deeper level, people care about emotive place because it resonates more with them. That is why they join social movements. It's not that the, it's like the average person doesn't go into social movements thinking about logistics or how effective organization is per se. They don't like measure up the stats of different organizations. Rather, it's what the social movement stands for and whether that issue is important to these people. And when you have idealists, that messaging is a lot more clear 
there, that messaging appeals to a lot more people. And that is why you get more buy-in on our side of the house. Lastly, on audience, they kind of give this comparison between younger people and older people. We say that younger people make up the majority of social movements. They are the most important like audience to care about because while they might not have as much economic capital, they have they have political capital, they have more voting power, they're gonna be around longer, and therefore they're gonna still have a more in, like comparative impact long term and as well as politically. So for this, strongly urge a government ballot. Thank you. Great job, guys. I thought that was a super interesting round. Um, I think the judges are going to take a little bit of time to decide, and then we'll just, you know, say something when we're ready with our decision. Yeah, good job, everybody. Yeah, good luck. I think we're all ready to give reason for decision. Um, okay, um, I was the squirrel, um, and I voted for the government, which is to say congrats, opposition, friend, seminary, um, I'm going to, uh, swerve its RFD first, let's get right into it. So what ended up winning the round, I think that it was the independent reason that the, funnily enough, that the opposition gave which is the idea of prerequ prerequisite, right? Um, why is this? I think that essentially this kind of envoy idea of which side like actually like kind of produces better things for the movement ends up being so vague and unclear in that like there just isn't enough impact weighing done by either side. Um, okay, so why is this idealist come first, right? Is that I thought, is it like cyclical? Is it like realist and idealist, like kind of infinite back and forth? And I thought, no, I think that the government's concept is correct, that idealists kind of need to come first in terms of like creating balance and ideas for realists to strive for. That's on this idea of prerequisite for anything happening, which is given as a reason to vote by the opposition and then accepted by the government, government wins and they just win the round. Um, okay, I'm going to go through like the different points on flow. Media attention. I think that Gov is factually correct on this, but I don't think they win it because um, they don't kind of give enough warranting as to why the media wants to give attention to like idealists. I think there is warranting, which is that like media likes controversy. They're better speakers and that's more people watch them. I don't think that was really given. So Off was just kind of able to give a counterclaim and it essentially became a wash. Um, Convincing people, right? There's kind of this conflict between people generally act on their emotions versus people like believe in moderate ideals. Um, I mean, like at some point it kind of gets down to these claims. One of these claims is like true and makes sense in that people like act on their emotions. I'm much way more willing to buy that claim as being true versus like, I remember, what did I say on flow? People don't like polarization because they don't like align with political polls is kind of what is said in the first speech by Sophie and that's not warranting that's just a claim in a circle that's just a circular claim um so i just didn't really buy that um so i thought that um government is probably convincing more people but i do think that the warranting that um older richer people are probably somewhat better at like somewhat more important activist kind of per capita is probably true um and i really think that there was like clear kind of impact way as to why one is better than the other um, right, realists are harder workers, it's harder to become an idealist, like, once again, I think that this kind of flows through, although I don't think it was, like, in fact, it's, like, there's so much harder workers, like, they're, like, pushed harder on this kind of gambler's fallacy idea, um, but once again, I just don't think that, like, there's enough, like, it's, it's because you separate into five independent ballots that you don't give, like, a clear conception of how the round is, like, meant to look, you know, um, like what's actually like meant the whole world is meant to look like and you separate into like it's not doing weighing it's like you change what could have been weighing into like five different things of crystallization which i think is kind of silly um external perception right some of the outside world particularly dislikes in like a more idealistic movement i just don't think that this is like flowed through into like a serious impact in the round um uh, external perception on the government. Oh, sorry, interest, introspection on the government. I just thought it wasn't really flowed through all that much. I just kind of really weigh it. Um, and then out of the box, thinking this expanding of horizons like idea, I think kind of get the warranting kind of gets co-opted to be used as like 
I for this kind of prerequisite independent reason, and I think that works. But it also, but then you don't like separately kind of flow throughout the self contention, which is fine because it, it kind of went either end. Um, okay, I think the biggest problem was LOR's weighing speech. I just really think that like doing it in the five independent ballots sounds very fancy. Um, and it is very fancy, but also like you don't give me a clear conception of weighing. Instead, I wish that you combined like your three things into like why they matter. It, it, you send the first week, which is like these are the things that let the movement get its goals done. So then, like retranslate like your wins on these things and like why your wins are so important that they mean that like you get the goals done, even if you just have like a smaller group of like more moderate wealthy activists, right? That's what I would have wanted to see from the LOR that I think would have given you the win. Um, but because it was so vague, um, there wasn't, I don't think there was a clear enough image as to like what side actually does it. And also because both sides were kind of arguing under this idea of a movement, which is like, like a hypothetical movement composed purely of idealists versus purely of realists. Um, it just like, I don't know. I don't think that there was like, a, there was anything clear enough on flow to vote on anything other than this kind of independent prerequisite reason in which Gov wins. Um, I did consider, is it kind of a new point in the last speech? But then I thought, no, like they were basic, like they're kind of just reusing warranting from their second contention. So I thought it was fine, um, but clearly my conception of the was wrong. So hit me, Hana, and send it We can go next. Um, so yeah, so I, oh, sorry. Too no, much no, point. you can go. Okay. Um, yeah. So. I agree with some of what Isaac said. I think the biggest difference for me was that I conceptualized the round differently. I don't really buy the framing that comes out of opposition that there are three main goals of a movement. Because I think that like, when we're talking about what's better for social movements, I think the only real thing, and I think this is what all these things impact you, like more buy-in and all that stuff, just feeds into achieving change. Um, and I'm not really giving an, uh, given a compelling reason as to why I should care about these things independent of achieving change. Um, and so that's basically, that's the TLDR of why I vote off, is that I don't get a compelling reason out of government as to why idealists achieve change. Like I get all this stuff and, I, and some of it I buy, like I get this stuff about being like having an overarching narrative, having emotional appeal and like Isaac, I intuitively buy that more than I buy opposition's claim about like uh, stuff. Although I think it's like, uh, it's it's cleverly done stuff, what opposition does, which is like, you know, lofty claims are often seen as untrue and stuff like that. Like, um, so little washy, but I would flow it to Gov. But the problem is that even if it's slightly more appealing, it's not clear to me why movement growth or more idealists are so wonderful for a movement for two reasons. One, because it seems like even just one idealist is enough to like push the window to achieve moderate change, or at least I don't get an, any analysis on this. I don't decide on this because I feel like this is just my own analysis. But secondly, and I think this is important, is the analysis that comes out of Jenny's speech where Jenny basically says, if moderates are the one really achieving change, then we're really the important ones here and like, like screw the idealists basically. And while I don't necessarily agree with that, I just don't think there was enough government. I don't just don't think the government talked enough about this. I think the government has ways in which they can argue that idealists achieve change without talking about the Overton window. And I think that's what really was necessary. Like that was the impact that I needed at the end of your warranting, because I think these were all like quite compelling warrants. Like there's an appeal to the necessity of the movement. When you talk about gender equality, why that's more important to a movement than just talking about like um, fixing the pay gap. Uh, why, why something more broad can actually impact society more, why something that, why actually talking about your ideals is, is powerful for a movement and powerful for society. And like the independent um, ways that that can achieve change outside of the Overton window, that's basically why I vote opposition. And I know it's a silly reason, so I'll go through the rest of the things which I have on my like, the way I, the way I judge rounds. So government gives me this idea of creativity, um, that like radicalists are more creative because they care more. This is another place where I find this argument to be interesting, but a little bit washy, which is basically government asserts that, um, government, um, how would I call this? Government asserts that idealists are passionate and realists are not. And I think if there had been more warranting for this idea, I would have been more compelled to buy it. But I'm given like somewhat compelling reasoning from opposition that basically says that like, 
realists do care. The fact that they compromise, the fact that they think about this issue a lot means they care too. And also just like, as a factual matter, I don't buy that idealists are the only ones who care about movement. And I wish opposition had also, sorry, this is getting a little chaotic. I wish opposition had also done more to push back against this. Like we had really gotten into like why you think um, realists care more about the movement. You make these this kind of like blippy claim that like everyone is an idealist. Like like the people that put Black Lives Matter in their Insta bio about it, those, those, are, those are the kinds of idealists that you guys want to talk more about. People who just care about the ideal of the movement, but don't care about achieving actionable change. Like, I think that's a, a, a powerful tool that opposition can use. But more than that, I think the tool that you guys want to use is just framing realists in, in the most positive light possible, which is like, these people care so much about the movement that they're willing to compromise to make change. And using that as a comparative and saying, people who are idealists and just care about this one thing and aren't willing to make comprom compromises are not like the true motivators or the true like essence of the movement, if you will. So anyway, I'm given enough reasoning from opposition to say to say that like I don't I don't think idealism equates to passion. I don't think passion is unique to the government side, and thus I don't buy a lot of what the government says about like the government appeals to people because of their overarching narrative. Like I think the implicit um, op response is like we have an overarching narrative too. It's obvious when we care about the pay gap that we're also passionate about sexism, and we have some level of emotional appeal, even if our emotional appeal isn't the same type of emotional appeal that the opposition gets. Again, don't vote there, not explicitly said by the opposition, which it was, but it still you know, exists. Um, government has more ideas about like introspection, um, the perception of the movement, um, outreach. I, I, I vote, uh, or not vote, I side gov on the barrier of entry point. I think that's very, quite well argued from government. But again, to me, it all comes down to like, what is the actual purpose of movements? And insofar as the only real impact I see is, is achieving change. And I don't have a way in which idealists on their own without moderates achieve change, which I think, again, is like kind of, it, it's just, a, I think it's a not strategic concession. Like, I think there have been plenty of radical people that have achieved change in the past. And Dan alludes to this in, in his final speech, which is that, like, um, you know, at one point, the civil rights movement was super radical. And it was this idealist that pushed this forward to a moment in which MLK could be like, guys, you know what? Like, the bus being open to people of all different races sitting in every different spot is actually the, like, less radical version of the claim. Like, if you made the argument about the historical evolution from idealist to realist, as opposed to just like the Overton window argument, I think that also would be uniquely appealing. I, I kind of honestly think this is a little bit new and I also wish this had been in another speech. The other thing I want to just say as a general piece of feedback for the teams is I think that both of the member speeches um, needed to work a little bit on word economy. Like I think a lot of the claims that are made are, are very repetitive. Um, uh, and especially Ming in your speech, I thought you were making like very powerful claims, but I think you were wasting a lot of time as well. Like you would, I think in the beginning of your speech, you spent maybe like at least three minutes. I wasn't timing, but it felt, it felt like quite a long time talking about, um, why, why idealists depend on realists to, uh, why realists depend on idealists to make the change that they need to, to change. And I think that like, just cut that down a little to what you need to say. And that way you have more time going back. Um, into your own case and strengthening those things. I also just personally don't love the like cross application thing because I think that leads to more counterclaims than genuine rebuttals. And I think that leads to like just two very opposite narratives that end up being very hard to judge. But overall, I thought it was a super interesting round. I thought there were very compelling arguments made by both sides. And I guess what really led to my decision was just like the impacting of the entire round um, and the framing that I think is just the, of what social movements are four. So yeah, so that's where I vote opposition. But great round, guys. I found it very interesting to show. Um, so I mean, for sake of job, everybody, Hannah used that a lot of what I was going to say. Um, but I'll be brief. I actually, in, a little bit differently than Hannah, I did think that the three categories, the way, uh, Sophie, you weighed at the end by splitting into sort of three categories of like sections that you were talking about, you know, uh, focusing on active change, the dedication of like the people that were the dedication of the activists and the dedication and of societal buy-in. I didn't really think of that as many. I thought that was just a really nice way to organize the final speeches because those are really just the overarching categories of that all the arguments that we had fit into. Um, I ended up voting gov a lot of because of Jennifer's like pre reasoning that 
it is a it was it did sort of come down to a chicken and egg situation in the end where you're like oh these people are helping the realists are making sure that idealists can exist and idealists are helping realists exist but i think the opposition warranted a bit wetter a bit better the idea that realists are able to get things done even without idealists help albeit maybe not as effectively and so all of the government's like benefits of like you know idealists working sort of fell down fell down the point that like they never proved to me why idealists were so unique to helping realists why they were so much more valuable and if idealists aren't able to do anything without realists then obviously I have to go vote that realists are more important um a couple main points of clock and a couple points that I thought were really interesting I think could have been could potentially swayed the round um, I thought the point about societal engagement, about, you know, the youth versus the elders was really interesting. I, Dan, you brought up in your final speech this point that, like, the youth now composes the majority of the population and that later on in life, they're going to be probably the more involved people. That's why you should support idealists. I thought that if that was brought up earlier in, in the round, that could have really swayed the round because you because that gave me a tangible reason to vote for why idealists were actually going to help the movement succeed. But because you brought up, I think, like your last 30 seconds of your speech and you didn't really weigh it, it I couldn't really vote on it. Um, and that's why I thought also the impacting about how older voters who are more reason who, you know, are going to be investing money and votes, there's people are more likely to vote for the realists. I also bought the fact that if you're going to be investing your money in it, you'd rather know what, where it's going to your plan that you're buying into rather than just, oh, this is a great idea. Because if you're going to actually put in your money and cloud into it, you you want to know what you're doing. So that's also flowed to op for me. Um, yeah, I mean, everything else has been pretty much said. I thought that we had some great speeches. I completely agree with the fact that the uh, member of government, leader of op uh, member of opposition and member of government speeches were both very powerful, but I'll be a bit wordy. Uh, I thought they, they could have been, I thought you guys could have signed posted a bit better or just organized just to make it a bit more easier on the flow. Because like my flow has like this one big column. It's it's very, it's, it was a little bit hard to read afterwards. But overall, really great speeches, um, a lot of great clash, and yeah. Thank you. Yeah, thanks for judging. Thank you so much. Yeah, Good luck, guys.